can be a really key component. The male harvest, especially when there's known age. Our sample size, uh, we use that a lot, especially in bighorn sheep herds, to uh, help confirm our modeling efforts. And uh, we, we get a lot of good field observations of, of sportsmen and the general public that we also utilize in uh, ground truthing or checking and balancing our, our models. And all that previous years of, of data will help us uh, discern whether we're, we're accurate or not. Next, I want to uh, actually open up the model and, and kind of show you how, how to run this. the screen. Resolution is, is uh, a little weak, so you may not be able to see all the intersecrecies of everything in there. So we're actually, uh, our biologists, they, they enter all their survey data uh, by point class and by gender and, and age, uh, young of the year and, and adults, into the spreadsheet. And it uh, provides us with the buck ratios and the fawn, the fawn ratios. And for mule deer, uh, we, uh, we attempt to survey both in the fall and also in the spring. So we're looking at uh, fecundity of, of what's hitting the ground and surviving for a few months in the fall, and then ultimately what is being recruited in the spring. So all that data goes directly from the biologist's uh, data, data sheets, uh, into, into the model. And without hunt questionnaire data, uh, we would we would be uh, having a difficult time to uh, discern the accuracy of these models, as Tony talked about in that example of a thousand animals. If uh, you you collect a certain amount uh, of bucks in your in your survey, so you have a ratio of males to females, and you know what the harvest numbers were, the real not just a rate, but the number of bucks and does harvested then that removal uh, from your population can help us determine the magnitude of that, that herd. There has to be so many females that gave birth. There has to be so many fawns that survived to one, two, three, four years of age to allow for those bucks to be harvested uh, by a certain point class or, or age. So we, we put in the... Uh, 
the harvest by point class in this sheet. Uh, for does, we put in the number of does, and then the model, the algebraic equations, will uh, assign that total number of does into the age classes as they exist proportionally uh, of the total does that we estimate. So if, if majority of the does are yearlings and two-year-olds, uh, there's, there's a high likelihood that most of the does are yearlings and two-year-olds. And it, so it proportionally uh, uh, directs that, that harvest. For bucks, we know that some of our herds, we have selectivity occurring by the sportsmen and all throughout the West, including Nevada, even though we, have, we do have a lot of trophy-minded hunters, the biggest, uh, most important age class of harvest is probably the two-year age class, at least in a mule deer harvest situation. So our biologists are asked to uh, look at the point class, uh, and we are attempting to distribute point class data into age class data. Uh, so here's, here's the point class data, and then we have each column is, is an age class, one, two, three, four, five. And so our, our biologists are uh, discerning, uh, be, based on their best information and uh, point class information, even, even Hunter comments, of what percent of the two-year-olds were harvested. So based on that, and, and there's, there's, uh, we're going to uh, try to put in something high, something low, something moderate, and, and see how that distribution plays out with the existing uh, herd that was available prior to the hunting season. So that, that's, we're going to do our best to distribute that age class. And we, we'll, we'd be talking about the uh, management bull hunt Tomorrow, uh, Larry talked about, we looked at this model years ago because of elk. Um, and with an elk herd, we used to collect age data. Uh, it was something that I felt was important for all of us to see. Uh, and we also collect age data for bighorn and mountain goat. But uh, not only is it great to have the number of bucks harvested, but to have the known age. Or, a, or an approximation of that, those age classes that are harvested. You have to have a lot of animals out there to be killing four, five, six-year-old bucks versus if you're just harvesting your annual recruitment of bucks. So if a lot of states have, have low buck ratios. They're putting a lot of pressure and harvesting a lot of the yearlings and two-year-olds. And uh, that's, that's sustainable, actually, with a smaller population. But, if you're growing and maintaining older age animals, uh, you have to have even a, a larger population to support those animals that are surviving to that age class. Uh, the next sheet, nothing really we use much for mule deer, but it, it accounts for ingress and egress. So it's a big one for our bighorn sheep populations uh, and even elk herds that uh, from time to time seem to be very nomadic. Uh, uh, sometimes they're very difficult to, to track between winter and summer range and whether they stay or go, uh, which seasons do they, do they come in. And so uh, we have a, a separate sheet where known ingress and egress, or, or our best estimate of that, is occurring. So all of our bighorn transplants, uh, they're, they're accounted for in this sheet. Uh, the next sheet is... Uh, a big part, these parameters uh, are the survival rates that uh, are kind of, you know, the, the very structure of, of any model and uh, along with the, the recruitment of young. So we have each column represents a certain age class, uh, fawns, yearlings, two-year-olds. We lump three to, three to ten, three to eleven-year-old uh, males and females together. Uh, and then the older age class, we don't have much uh, for mule deer beyond 12. But uh, this, this allows our biologists, if there was a specific seasonal event, whether it's a, a winter loss in mule deer 
or an extreme drought period uh, for some of our bighorn sheep or sometimes even mule deer uh, are, are uh, forced uh, to deal with some pretty harsh summers. We have the ability to uh, increase, decrease that survival rate by age class, by season. Uh, and those seasons are pretty much the spring, summer, and late fall through, through uh, early to mid, mid winter. We also have some, some basic fecundity rates. Uh, we pretty much know that every two year old doe is likely to have a fetus. Uh, what happens to that once, uh, even before it hits the ground, it's anyone's guess. But again, I'll, I'll in, inject right here the checks and balances that we have in our model. Our surveys are what's really driving this model. So we can best guess maybe there's a few yearling does that are being pregnant. Most of the two-year-old plus pregnant are, are, does are pregnant. We probably lose that opportunity once they're 12, 13, 14. But our survey that we, that we collect primarily with a helicopter is what's going to be injected into that survey page and that will kill off all the fawns that were alive uh, soon after birth. It's going to kill them off at the known rate that we collected in the field of how many fawns per 100 does that we saw on survey. Uh, and that's probably, probably the single uh, most important value that is, quote, driving this, this model bus. Uh, the next sheets are just snapshots over the course of, the, uh, of a year. We have a snapshot in December um, and uh, April and September. And again, um, I wish you could see this a little bit better, but uh, I think it's, it's a real important and, uh, part of our model is we're tracking these cohorts, cohorts through time and, for example, if we had a really harsh winter once uh, 10 years ago or, or maybe five years ago for a mule deer herd, we know that that fawn class is weak. And that weak fawn class is going to be represented through time. And as we get into the two, three, four-year-old age class, where the, uh, the, probably that takes the, the, the largest amount of our harvest, uh, we know we have to look, look for that and account for that uh, when we get to that year when they're old enough to be harvested. And so we can see the effects of past influences on those animals. And then we just uh, have a results page that uh, summarizes some of the information in the model. And uh, that's, that's really in a nutshell what it's all about. All right, before we get to too far along and asking questions on this, since this is an action, I would like to open it up to public comment on it. If there's any public comment on item 8888A, this would be the time. Seeing no public comment, and we had a lot of cards, so, and most of them all said all, so I'll be looking there. It's looking up. Okay. Close public comment hearing on this. Come back to the commission. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. Um, Mike, and I'll just address you, uh, I guess. You know, I know, I know you're very sincere and very knowledgeable in this area, but I'm going to uh, quote a little bit from a, from a scientist that I've been reading about, and, uh, and this is coming out of an article by Dr. Charles Kay, The Art and Science of Counting Deer. And uh, he goes into quite a bit on the uh, precision and accuracy of counts. And you know, uh, like a, a precision is putting five shots in a half inch, but if they're two feet off the target, they're not accurate. And the various ways you can count deer, you know, ground counts, aerial surveys, population models, pellet groups, thermal imaging, which is a new one that I'll bring up at a later meeting, but uh, some of the things uh, uh, that he talks about, and I've read other articles, this sort of a summary of, 
a lot of the thinking and, and you know, citability bias and things like that and seasonal observers and he, he talked about and then there's a big there's a big deal of politics in here. Uh, you know, the, uh, the bio, does a biology department higher up want low counts or a high count? You know, does a farmer want a high count or low count? And politics does play a part in this. Uh, and he made, a, he made a big effort here with consulting for a wealthy oilman. And he went up with the wildlife people, the biologists, to count the number of elk. And uh, he said uh, everything was uh, uh, copacetti. He was in the back seat and they counted it. And uh, then he went up again a week later and he would see more elk than the state claimed were in the entire area. And what is the difference? Well, the difference is the way they design their uh, counts. They went up in the morning when they could see the animals better. And he said when they went up with the Department of Wildlife, they would, for whatever reason, they wouldn't get in the air till nine o'clock and he was in the air at seven. And he'd fly the valleys, not the mountains. And so the way you fly makes a big, big difference in what you see. And, uh, and he says, uh, what, is, what is a survey when you see 2,000 mule deer? What does it mean? Absolutely nothing, because you have no way of knowing whether that number is precise or accurate. And you got, you know, you got to determine the variation around the mean, which is a standard deviation. And, uh, and with multiple helicopter surveys, which are very expensive, and, and which you know we don't do, they're very expensive. And uh, then he uh, he uh, he goes into uh, some of the uh, uh, correcting on the data that you get, very, very scientific, and, uh, and assumptions whether animals are randomly dis distributed in an area and things like that. And when state biologists conduct game surveys, they always claim they're doing the counts under similar uh, circumstances, but the available data says uh, does not support that assumption. And, and then on the, on the computer part of it, uh, you see in many uh, uh, game departments have turned to population models. And uh, he's talking about the POP2 to estimate deer. And uh, there are a lot of difficulties with, the, with uh, po that population model. And they're subject to errors and political abuse. So you can produce any number you want by m manipulating the variables in the POP2. And uh, the other problems is that public, including hunters, have little understanding of population models and tend to believe whatever comes out of a computer, which is a very serious error. Uh, you know, the POP2 is a lessic matrix type, and it's been proven, of, and I'll, I'll mention some of the problems, and I know you got away from it when you first started, and maybe nobody knew it at the time. Uh, and you need a, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the first things he said, you, you know, in an estimate of how many yearling does are added to the population each year. And then you have to estimate the adult female survival or mortality. It's just the opposite of each other here. And uh, uh, the, the most important variable, contrary to what I heard today, is in population growth or decline is adult female survival, not fawn production or survival. If you have high adult female does survival, your deer herd can maintain its numbers, even if there is a poor fawn crop. And conversely, if you have a low adult female survival, high fawn survival will not save your herd. And that's, that's the opposite of what I heard a day. And I, you know, I'm, this, is, this is just ideas thrown out. I'm not here to criticize or something like that. This is constructive stuff. And I'll, I'll sum it up in a minute here. Uh, uh, difficulties rise whenever you look at how the input variables are determined. And as you know, I'm, I'm looking, I'm doing some work on that and, and the department's really helped me out a lot on, on the population, uh, looking at the uh, model that you're using here. And, uh, uh, and I think the, for the first question in foreign sportsmen or women need to ask is uh, how the initial population number is obtained. Because uh, I asked that question last week and, and I'm sure we'll get to it and it was, your, your initial population put into the computer years ago, you had a history of 15 years and you did use a change in ratio that gave population estimates on long term, but it's a very, very different model if you start with 50,000 deer and 100,000 deer. It just completely changes the model and I think you know that, so I, w I was going to be, a, you know, I'll be talking on that a little bit. I think the initial population size is 
critical what you what you put into the model, and um, uh, the uh, uh, it essentially says for any population model be forewarned. Do you have a low population estimate or a high population estimate? Do you want a declining population or an increasing population? You get whatever answer you want by varying your input parameters, and I think that's obvious. Um, uh, uh, you're talking about world-class modeling experts, and I think that that's, that's uh, important, and, I, and I'm going to make that suggestion here in, in, a, in a minute here. But, uh, you know, uh, another thing is talking about partial counts. And only, if you only count a small percentage of your total area and then multiply the density estimate by the size of your entire study to obtain a population estimate, which introduces even more potential error. And I think that's, I'm not saying, I think that's what we do because we have to do it. We can't do, we can't do any, any more comprehensive sampling, but you should be aware of the error it introduced. And, uh, and all estimates with both sampling and statistic variation uh, uh, have a lot of, lot of source of error. And it said, uh, 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 humans guess all the time. We call it gambling. You want to gamble with our mule deer herds, and that, he said that'd be a serious error. But uh, articles like this, and, and I want to talk about computer algorithms a little bit here. And they're based on assumptions. And uh, they have a... Uh, uh, Are there specific things that, that you could ask of, of our model instead of uh, well, I don't understand providing us I couldn't, what Charles K. wrote? I couldn't K. even read wrote. your model, but I'll be, I wanna, I'll, I'll go through that with you here, you know, and I'm doing it right now, but I'm just, I just want to, let me finish and, and make some just comments about it. Uh, and for the public here, you know, uh, you know, and you're using an algorithm, an algebraic formula to do this, okay? And you got to be aware of algorithms because uh, uh, the, the, I've got the algorithm the kill Wall Street, okay? And uh, this guy, this Chinese guy, Li, he had this Gaussian Campolo function. And, and the reason it was so powerful is because uh, they priced hundreds and millions and billions of dollars worth of CDs and mortgages on it. And I will show you... Uh, what that looked like, and it's just an algorithm like we use on modeling, modeling deer, and this is the algorithm. It's just a complex formula, and that brought Wall Street down billions and billions of dollars. And so, you know, you got to be careful because uh, an algorithm could bring uh, any population down, and you've got to be constantly looking at it. And the weakness of um, the data used in the POP2 model. It incorporates very little biology, which is why many scientists have abandoned it in favor of more realistic models. And I got a whole list of uh, the problems. I'm not even going to go into them. I think you're probably aware of them uh, with that Leslie matrix, how it calculates things. It was totally, uh, it totally didn't, it didn't have much biology in it. And, uh, and so, uh, like for example, the POP2 model didn't take into male age ratios or abundance or rates of pregnancy or survival for either males or females. And uh, there's much better models out there now and the one that you have, but the question is, do they incorporate enough biology? That's still a matter of debate. And uh, there's, some, there's some excellent uh, uh, computer science out there. And the bottom line is you can goose the algorithms to just find anything you want from the probability of default on a subprime mortgage to the probability that Anna Cole Smith will rise from the grave. And uh, I know when I checked your model, and, and I'm going to, and I, this is not the time to do it, but you have a variable in yours called a survival rate that I sometimes wonder about it. And, uh, and it, it's a variable you put into your model. And, you know, basically, um, uh, you know, Dr. Case published a lot on this, and and I'm not criticizing your department, but you know, there's there's some. I read some stuff by a lot of uh, scientists, PhDs mainly, and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, I'd put his. Uh, this is Charles K. Uh, resume against anybody's uh, any day, hands down. And I think this this is people like this you can learn from. So what I what I would 
think, and, and I, I might bring it up at a later, Dale, is, uh, and I know you're sincere and I know you're knowledgeable, but uh, I'm not saying your model is not working, but maybe we need reviewing by a computer modeling specialist. I don't know if you ever had that done, but there's people out there who can review this whole process because right now we're in a declining deer herd population. And, and I would like as a commissioner to see if there's anything we can do. And I'd like to, and you know, the modeling is the start of it, you know. Uh, field observation by sportsmen and the public, you hit it right on the nose. I keep getting hounded, you know, every week by sportsmen out there and saying, there's no deer, there's no deer, there's no deer, we gotta do something. So we gotta start with the seasons and the quotas and the hunting and, and the modeling of it. And I'd like to take a better look at this model uh, on a, on a fine tune by maybe professionals because it's no, it's no problem. Uh, maybe we're not taking advantage of all the science that we can. Uh, maybe it's a lack of time. Maybe it's egos. Maybe we're not wanting to change. Humans are, humans don't want to change. Uh, maybe we're not up to date with the latest philosophy and taking advantage of the latest. I don't know, but it's something that I think we as a commission should look at, maybe, you know, think outside the box. Maybe we need some different thinking. Uh, there's a lot of, and, and the public doesn't understand these algorithms, and you gotta, you, you know, and I don't understand them all, I'm telling you that right now. But there's professional low modeling specialists out there that would be glad to take a look at the computer and give us a report back, and uh, I, always, I always welcome any kind of criticism I get if it, it's going to make a better product, and I, I would think you would want it too, and I, I'm sure you'd want to do it, you know. But anyway, that's all I have to say about this. Okay, Mr. Bogler. Mr. Gilbertson, could I speak to you? You're supposed to. Work. Well, that's, that's your. Uh, there is the Fifth Amendment, I'm told. Oh. It's a joke for the record. <laughs> I realize, and you do too, that my tunnel vision hasn't changed in the last 26 years. We have conflicting ways to do something. In private enterprise, I have to deal with solutions. Mother Ray at the PCA demands I pay the money back I borrow. It's pretty simple. So if I get wandering off too far one way or the other, I have to readjust. All right. Carte blanche, you get everything you want. We've got, let's pick an area, 110 or 110, area 10 or 113. And the statistics show we have a declining herd. And you can do anything you want. We know that young does are no different than young cows. They're no different than young sheep. They're dumb. They make mistakes. They forget where they left their fawn. Uh, they don't protect them as well as an older fawn. They're making more vulnerable to predators. We know that forked horn bucks are not very bright. But every hunter I ever run into wants to have a hunting opportunity, and we are supposed to provide a certain number of them based on the model. What would your suggestion be? To stop hunting does or not hunt does? Or how, how would you in an area. It doesn't have to be statewide, but we're going to give you that opportunity to come up with a solution. Do we quit hunting forked horn bucks? They'll breed a certain amount of does, maybe not as many as an older mature buck, but do we quit hunt? I mean, what, what do we do? What, what would be your solution if, if you were allowed to do whatever you wanted in a, in a unit to well, increase that population? We'd have, you know, there's a lot of things to look at and a lot of things to evaluate, but on the, you know, everything from, from the, the PJ encroachment, depending on the habitat type you have, uh, the age classes of mountain shrub communities that provide summer habitats, to other impacts out there. I mean, there's a million things to look at for each deer herd and they're all, you know, some share a lot of the same and some have different. But on the subject of, of doe harvest, um, I'm not gonna go there right now. Uh, what I'd like to point out is um, we've been most protective in the state of Nevada in not hunting female deer because for some reason with sportsmen, it's a no-no issue in Nevada. And so I will contrast that with elk, which you're very familiar with, Commissioner Bogler. 
And we have been harvesting cow elk at a very high rate for a long time. And that's because we have population objectives, uh, commitments with the livestock industry to keep them at certain population levels. And um, a good example is in the uh, Jarbage, when we had our first population objective of 300, uh, we started the, the, when the population got close to that 300 and we had to keep it there, we had our first hunt to, you know, try it out and see how the cow hunt was going to work. We had eight tags, and there was some wilderness area up there, and it was hard access. And we went from eight tags to 50 tags to 200 cow tags on a population of 300 elk, a total population of 300 elk. We had 200 cow tags, and we did it for several years to keep that population at 300. In contrast, during those years, we had some doe recommendations, and I was at some of the same county game board meetings, and we just got done talking about an elk population of 300, and we sold 200 cow tags. And they'd look, the same board would approve that, no problem, and they'd look at a deer herd that had 3,000 deer, 10 times more deer, and we couldn't get a quota of 15 or 20 doe tags out of it. Another species we hunt hard is antelope. You can look at our antelope populations in northern Nevada, especially up in the Elko area, where we've got limited deer or uh, limited winter range for, for antelope. And we've been harvesting uh, female antelope like crazy up there. And on top of that, we've been trapping and transplanting out of those populations. And they continue to perform. When a population is challenged, they perform, they produce and that population maintains itself and we continue to do that year after year. And the final thing I'll point out would be the river mountains, bighorn sheep. We harvest a lot of uh, female sheep out of there. It's called trapping and transplanting. And uh, Pat Cummins, if he's still here, could tell you the numbers, but we've removed a tremendous number of female bighorn sheep out of the river mountains. That population continues to thrive and do well. Deer is the only one that we don't, so that's, there's, okay. but there's a lot of other factors besides how we, I'm how just, we harvest down. Larry, maybe you didn't understand my question. I, the other is just modeling, statistics. We've got other herds that are going up and down, but one thing we all pretty well agree on is that we're, there's a problem with the deer. In some areas, there are those that believe that it's competition with the elk, and there's lots of reasons that may be out there. but. If you had one unit and you were going to increase the number of hunting opportunities in that unit, what would you do? Would you continue to no harvest of, uh, of females, uh, no harvest of forked horns? Well, based on what I just said, no harvest of females wouldn't be the, necessarily the best thing to do. Again, you'd have to look at what are the limiting factors in that particular herd and, and see if you can afford to or are even able to make the changes necessary. I mean, some of the urbanization on the Sierra Frontier, we're beyond uh, being able to help some of those deer herds. The winter range is gone. So it depends on the individual herd and what, what's really available, what you can do. Um, and as far as, you know, collecting data and that kind of thing and population models, if, if Commissioner Lang can find some sort of a population model that, in, that increases deer, boy, we'd buy that. That'd be pretty amazing. Um, and, and, you know, we've read that paper by, by Dr. K, and, and considering he's a sociologist, it's kind of interesting. Uh, he doesn't have, you know, the biological background, and he's making some pretty interesting comments in that paper. Uh, but anyway, uh, and we keep talking about POP2. We don't use POP2, you know. We don't use it. So... Uh, but there's a lot of different things we can do, and, and our biologists are, are, are all out there on the ground. They're looking at their, their habitats and their deer herds, and they're coming forward with various recommendations and heritage project suggestions. Uh, some, some biologists are looking at pinyon juniper uh, projects to try to increase habitat. Uh, up in Area 6, we've been working for years to increase deer winter range. Um, we're, we're looking at removing fences in some areas. We've done that uh, up in uh, Area 7, trying to get our deer to migrate and be able to migrate more safely. We've got uh, overpasses and underpasses, uh, the first ones in the state of Nevada going in north of Wells. Uh, we just recently, uh, uh, the UNR researchers uh, were monitoring that overpass and documented 3,000 deer that made it over this very first year over the overpass. That's 3,000 less deer standing on the highway for the snowbirds to hit and the school buses going north to play games at, at uh, 
jackpot. And so each biologist is looking at his area and looking for opportunities and things that he can do to increase deer. And then the other thing about this, the, the crashing deer herd, I keep hearing how deer are about to disappear. And, and people are comparing the 1980s deer population estimates with today's. And we used a, a whole different model, as Commissioner Lent pointed out, a completely different model. It was very robust, and it had uh, it, it increased harvest built into it. And when you increase your harvest, whether it's real or not in the model, you have to have a bigger population in order to with, sustain that harvest. And that's what we did in those years. We were using higher mortality factors and other things in the model. And so you, and it's a completely different kind of model. You can't directly compare today's deer numbers to then. Probably, if, you, if we took the old model from the 80s and applied it today's, to, to today's deer herd and used the same methodology, we'd probably be looking at a deer population estimate a bit higher than we are with this, this model. So this model we're using now is more conservative. And over the long term, if you look at populations from the 50s all the way till now, we're probably not tremendously under average in the state of Nevada. We're, we're probably a little, little, just a little below average for the state. Some deer herds are actually performing pretty well right now. Um, what I, hate, I hate to say it because I've been listening for six months how there's no deer in Area 10. And I, it was hard for me to not just break out laughing. Area 10 is performing extremely well at the current time. We've had record, all-time record helicopter samples, starting with Tony Wasley's last year or so. He, Tony classified more deer than Steve Foree ever did in the, eight, the big years of the 80s. And now, and that hasn't just stopped. We have a new biologist in there, brand new, and he continues to get record sample sizes out of there. It's incredible, and we're seeing, you know, the only thing, we're not, we don't have quite as high fawn ratios as we did in the 80s. And all we have to do is have one good weather year, and you're going to see a, a, a tremendous increase in that herd. It has the potential right now, the base population's high enough in 10, that we could actually see huge increases if we just get a couple of good back-to-back -back weather years. And we could actually see people complaining about too many deer real quickly in that particular area. So I mean, it, it just really, it varies by, by area. It really does. All right, um, we've got a couple things here. We'll stick with me, and then we've got Mr. Pearl, we've got Mr. Lent. Um, one is, and hopefully direct questions we can ask. I know. Hopefully you'd like a couple of these. I think, I think um, you know the answer to a couple of these here. Is there any proprietary information that cannot be legally made available to the public that's part of this model? That you know of? I don't, I don't of? know. I'm just a biologist. Nothing you know of, nothing you heard of, we won't be thrown in jail. I, mean, I hate to be thrown out state secrets, CIA is going to be in here. You know, I'm just throwing this, uh, just a question. Not why would you it. ask that? Huh? Why would you ask that? Okay. Why? I, why would I ask that? Because, you know, in order to be careful in government, the most important thing we can do is create transparency. I've been told that again. It's not my words. I keep hearing that from these legal people. So, this uh, model is an equation. Can, I have not seen the equation. Can we get the equation? I'm, you know, I'd like to see the equation. I'd like to see all the variables that go in the equation. I'm, I mean, you have, obviously you have that. Uh, undoubtedly you look at it every year. You know, we throw that out there, post it on the website. The world, greatest transparency is the greatest thing. And that's about as, that's the most careful I can think of a way a government could be. And then if there's any criticism, they'll have a great chance to look at it and hash it over and we can, uh, you know, anyways, it can go on from there. So the request for information would be that. Um, okay, we've had this, I'd like to see this data that's on here. Um, of course, you know, it's sent to the commission. Uh, you're, I couldn't see it, but I'm, and I'd like to look at it great on. Maybe we can look at it at a later date after we get a chance to, I might have some questions on it at another meeting, but I can't today. So if we could just get that. That's the item here today is discuss and request information, part of the information is what you put up there. I would appreciate that. The model itself, list of variables, a intriguing thing was the value, I got lost a little bit in that, but the, mo the one that you referred to specifically is the most important value. Um, a little brief explanation on that, actually the minutes might even explain part of it, but you know, kind of maybe a, you know, one paragraph on what, what the issues are with that, 
if possible. And that's, oh, possible error factors in the equation. I mean, you know what they are. You know what they are better than anybody else. If you could throw those out to us. All right, that's the end of mine. We got Daryl and we got. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And you have the button push. Um, at the, uh, I attended the winter meeting of WAFWA in Tucson, and one of the issues that was discussed quite at length in both the commissioner's meeting and in the joint meeting was the increasing uh, use or experimentation with uh, UAW, uh, UAVs um, for various type of activities. Uh, part of it is due to the fact that uh, that's dangerous work to be flying, uh, doing counts in helicopters and the like. Uh, in fact, Idaho has lost some people here recently and that uh, California had before in that. Uh, so they're looking at the possibility of, uh, you know, using UAVs, drones, uh, equipped with either infrared or widescreen video or whatever uh, for that activity. Now, obviously, you can't use those in transplantation situations, but it seems to me like we ought to take a real strong look at when we do counts, instead of paying $850 an hour base cost for a helicopter, uh, one of the, uh, and I had asked for some figures on it, uh, this one that is in use now and is used in some of the states is, uh, uh, would cost approximately $38,000. Now obviously that doesn't take into account uh, the user time, you know, but they do indicate that uh, uh, probably biologists could be trained to uh, operate those uh, UA UAVs um, and uh, would reduce the risk for loss of, of uh, personnel uh, and actually could provide, because of their ability to loiter in areas and that, a more accurate uh, situation with regard to counts. So my question to you is, have, have you guys looked at the possibility of uh, securing uh, UAVs, uh, both from a cost factor and what personnel situations might have to be and what cost savings there might be uh, in doing that instead of helicopters? My last... Uh, we actually did evaluate that about eight, nine years ago. Um, well, there's a lot of difference between eight, nine years ago now with these UAVs. A lot mm -hmm. of difference. Yeah, there was certainly some huge limitations back then. Uh, they had, you know, I've got some information to be glad to give to you from experts that are, that uh, uh, eight years ago you didn't have predators. Uh, so, you know, the fact of the matter is that. Uh, predators being a I, I un mean, unmanned aircraft of a certain type. Well, certain types of predators. Define that. Aircraft. And, and so I think it would behoove us to update our information with regard to UAVs. Secondly, I don't know about a degree in psych sociology, but the information that I've been given is that, uh, that Dr. K has a PhD in wildlife ecology, so, okay. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Lent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I had a, you know, and uh, I just want to respond a little bit. You know, we as a commission, are looking at everything from validity of counting to the validity of the modeling, Mike. And we're, we're, trying, we're just trying to improve the system one way or the other. And so I'll ask the question to the chief of game. Has the, has you, has the model ever been reviewed by a professional modeling specialist? And you know, I, I certainly know of a good one if you don't know of a good one. Is that, no, it wouldn't be Dr. K. I have some better ones than Dr. K, but has it ever been reviewed by a professional, no modeling specialist? You brought it to uh, Western States Deer Working Groups, haven't you? And you've gone over with other professionals. Yeah, it hasn't formally been reviewed. It's been shared with, with a lot of the Western States. Uh, we have a very similar uh, model to Colorado. There's certainly is more advanced. Uh, they use a lot of more prob probabilistic, stochastic event simulating, but uh, we, w we welcome it. I mean, you know, you know models don't kill animals. 
Models don't kill deer. Uh, they're not the cause of the decline of deer. Uh, we probably should focus on what, what that is. And, and I mean, we, we spent a lot of time with people here today talking about something that is not the cause of your, your frustration. And I guess if we could just focus on that, um, it, we'd probably be better off and time, time more well spent. Oh, go ahead. You know, uh, models don't kill deer, but the results are the model kills deer. So if we're not modeling the deer right, and we're, doing, and we're not doing the seasons and quotas and everything right, that kills deer because humans are predators, and humans do have an effect on deer. So the models specifically don't kill deer, but you know, that's one of the factors that goes into what we base everything on. Well, if you remember, uh, can, can Tony I, Wasley let, let me just respond to this, Mike. Really, um, you know, that's why I went through the history of the modeling a little bit and all the different techniques that are used. And it can be as simple as, in the old days, in the 60s, I mean, we had guys who, who counted tracks in the 60s in Area 10. They used to do track counts in snow and sand and, and uh, rake them out, and more deer would go through, and you'd try to guess if there was 30 deer or 300 deer making the tracks in the morning. And actually, I looked at some of those old estimates using that methodology, and they came up with about 24,000 deer in those days for Area 10. And that's, not, that's a pretty average type. We've got that kind of an estimate nowadays. And so I was pretty impressed it, it, using that methodology way back then. And so there's a lot of methodology we can use. But what's really unique about our model is it's not just predictive. And it doesn't just have a bunch of guesswork in there. We actually go out and measure real parameters. And then we adjust numbers in the model, those survival rates and things you're talking about, so that it re the model reflects real data that we collect. And so that, that's one thing that makes it really better than, than just these predictive models and theoretical models and things. The other thing about our population estimates and the resulting quotas and, and hunting that we, we do on our, our species here in Nevada and everywhere, I mean, the, the whole history of, of modern wildlife management is based on the reason we have hunting of any species is because we use adaptive management and we ensure that the harvest or hunting seasons we set up do not negatively impact populations out there. That's what hunting's about. We're trying to maintain and or improve wildlife populations, and that's how hunting is designed. And in our models, when we do a population estimate, Tony mentioned it earlier, we have these other checks that when we're done at the end of the year, we look at point class in the harvest, we look at hunter success rates, we look at sample sizes out there, We've had people who've flown some of these areas for 20 years, and we expect to get a certain number of deer in certain areas. And if the biologist goes out there and, and, and sees a lot more than usual, that, that's a good feeling, and it makes him think, okay, things are probably going up. If he goes out there and, and is used to seeing a few thousand deer and only sees 1,000, maybe the first time you might think there's some visibility thing or a wind factor or something that the deer weren't there. But if it happens two years in a row, and this guy who's flown for 20 years can't find them, we start making adjustments in the models. Right. And after we harvest, the other thing we look at, like I said, was point class in the harvest. Uh, back in the 80s, when we had really good deer numbers and lots of tags and record deer harvest throughout the state of Nevada, except for Area 6, which had already burned, we, uh, okay. in contrast, Utah was selling three or 400,000 deer tags over the counter. They had you know, just tons of hunters over there. And the, some years, their harvest was 80% spikes in forkies. And obviously, like Mike mentioned earlier, that's a, a state that was pushing their deer herd. It, it, it doesn't hurt the deer herd, but that harvest shifted to almost all spikes in forkies, 80%. And I, we've, we, during the 80s, I think I saw a few mm. areas go up to 45, maybe close to 50% spikes in forkies when we were really harvesting them hard. So if we're overestimating consistently, if you consistently overestimate and you're giving out too many tags, pretty soon the hunter success is going to go down. Hunters aren't going to be able to find big ones at all. And about all that's left are the fawns and things that survive to be yearlings, those little spikes and forkies. And you're going to see that shift. And you'll know it doesn't mean the deer herd is hurt because deer can reproduce down in the, with five and 10 bucks per 100 does, they can still reproduce. All right, we're so, going to have and, to. And, the, and, and just the, the, the only other thing is, is the sample sizes and the point class and the hunter success at hunters. So all, those, all that helps us check and know that we're not way overestimating or underestimating. We're in the ballpark. 
And that's, that's the best you can be with animals that you can't put in a pen and count one at a time coming out through the chute. Excellent. Thank you. Hey, we have one more um, comment from Commissioner McBeth, but you know, once we get done with that, we kind of really need to get moving on to the next item. And I'd, after that, I'd like to see if, you know, if anybody's missed an action item. If you have any requests for information, we could follow Mr. McBeth's. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think I just got my answer, but um, I just want to point out that it seems to me um, that if you're doing trend analysis, if you're actually looking at this over a longer term period of time, that if there's an error, if errors are being made, it's going to pop. It's going to have to pop out somewhere. Either, either, either you're going to have, uh, you know, um, harvest is going down, or, or the counts are going to, you know, all of a sudden, deer that you didn't think there were just going to materialize if there was an error somewhere. It just seems to me. I haven't got it. I hand, my hands around your entire model yet, but it just seems to me that when you look at it from a trend analysis and you look at it over time, that there might be errors that are made, you know, uh, year by year. But overall, it seems to me that it has to come out in the wash. Mr. Thanks for paying attention. Um, Mr. Mayor? May make one comment here as an old deer biologist. Half my career spent doing exactly this. One of the th parts of this discussion that we haven't had is bucks, and listen very carefully, bucks only harvest does not affect total population. So what we're talking about here is the number of males in the population, not the population crashing because we issued too many buck tags. The last time I checked, bucks don't make other deer. They gotta have a doe. So that's why we're very careful on the antlerless harvest side of things. Um, so I, and clearly, if we were over harvesting the buck segment, we would be hearing from the sportsmen in a big way because they couldn't find a four pointer. If you look at our harvest uh, results, we kill a heck of a lot of four point bucks. So uh, I think the, the, you hit it on the head, Mr. McBeth. It's, it's a long term trend. When you start making mistakes, you see it, and you see it in the field, and, and you can make corrections, and the adaptive management strategy is exactly it. And we'd certainly be able to show you the algebraic um, uh, expressions for the model. It's a pretty simple, straightforward thing. Uh, invite you to Reno. We'll sit down, and we'll take the guts out of it and let you look at it and get your calculator, and you can do the same thing with a calculator as you can do with a, with a spreadsheet model. All right. Um, can we get that? I mean, just... For the entrance transparency and so we maybe don't have to have these questions and spend time on it in the future. Can we get that just posted online so we can, the whole world can take a look and is that an issue? I don't think so, but I'm not sure that that's all that productive. Uh, what I will talk to Mike about is that we've been talking for some time to, to, to publish in a peer reviewed journal, you know, our model and, and what goes in it from a, an, a, a mathematical perspective, but. Uh, all right, all right, um, go ahead. Uh, absolutely. Uh, one of the comments was made here, I think we're like either second or third in the nation on the expenditure of um, predator uh, fees for predator control. And we do make an adapt. You know, when we take our, our biologists in the field, taking a look at what's going on in their unit, if they believe to be predator limited or predator affected, we're going to propose a predator project. But we've never been anti-predator management. I don't know where this comes from. But the fact of the matter is that if you take a look at the number of dollars spent on predator management before I came here to now, irrespective of what the commission has approved, it's gr it doubled. So uh, we do adapt to that, absolutely. All right. Do we have any motions on uh, subject things? I mean, you know, I'd like to see something in the form of, you know, what, we're, what we've been asking for here is discuss. We already did that part. Request information concerning the department's computer model recommendation process. You know, I'd like to see something along the lines of um, posting a complete equation online, including all up-to-date changes and explanations, all variables. Uh, whatever else you guys got, ready for a motion subject. Go ahead. Uh, if you want a motion, I, I'd be prepared to make a motion. I'd like to like to motion and, and if I don't get a, see if I get it right, but I'd like to make a motion that we have a, a, a live demonstration of uh, A to Z from, I mean, an, an actual working, take a given area and, and run it through to the very end and uh, demonstrate with a model for any commissioner, any public to, to look at. And also, uh, like if you, like I think what you were saying is you'd like to have it transparent and for everybody else to see 
uh, on the internet or on the website yeah. or whatever. And uh, if if that's if that's what you'd like in a motion, if that cover everything you want in a motion, then I'd make that motion. May we have motion on the floor? Uh, yes. Okay, we have motion a second on the floor. We have a question on the motion. Have, have a live demonstration at a future meeting and to prior have it po have the have what posted the the algorithm or have the it. algorithm and explanation for all the variables posted uh, before we vote on the motion uh, how long would this take well I might make a comment in March you know we normally have the cab training mm -hmm. so maybe that would be an opportunity to do a live demonstration and I'm sure I can get Mike to come up with the algebraic expressions mm -hmm. in the spreadsheet model. You can probably and get that bring in your two algebra minutes. hat and yeah. have at it. Beautiful. So, with, with, uh, with the motion then to make it March, a specific date. Would you like to? Would you like to restate your motions, uh, including uh, we can do that in March? If that, I don't, I don't want to burden the department if that's the best for them, but if you say March, then it's got to be March, and if they're sure they can do it, then I would change the motion, but can, I don't want to, I just said to. So. Well, it's kind of, this is the first we've heard of it. I, I, I'd have to talk to Mike. We have a lot of other things going on as far as um, putting, so we can actually have a deer season. Um, Mike? I know where Mike's at. Is that something we have? Springtime certainly is a busy time. It is. Yeah. Why don't, can, yeah, it's hard for me to say until we actually sit down and lay out the matrix but, of all the things yeah. we have to do. But we can it. see, we, I mean, let's what, look at our schedule June. first. All right. Well, it makes sense to have before the heart, before um, season quota sets, we got March and we got April. May, we don't want to do it in May. So, you know, March or April is the appropriate time. I'll uh, change the motion and say March or April. Is that acceptable for the second? No second. Everybody understand the motion? Uh, question on the motion. Could we have a clearer copy? <laughs> I couldn't read anything. That no, was I here. couldn't either. I, 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 I got to get a copy of that. Could have been Chinese. Well, I always like to present fuzzy logic. Okay. So, uh, I, I think you must you be from Berkeley because that's where All right. it came from. So let's go with the motion we have now and then uh, it, it, do we need to have, uh, then be, before I get to that, do I need to have, um, Mr. Mayor, perhaps, do we need to have, a, uh, would it really be necessary to have a motion to get a clear copy of everything that was no, on and this I, And I think, you know, this is the worst place for yeah. PowerPoint presentations. But, they haven't changed. But we but can get a copy of this, sure. no problem, um, digitally sent to us, emailed. Sure. Okay. Right. We work on that. Okay, so we don't need any uh, motion on that. Okay, we got a motion and a second on the table. Everybody understand that motion. All in favor of the motion signify by stating aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes eight to zero. Unanimous. Any other motions? Okay. Just want to check if there was anything else on something else. Thank you. Let's move on now to item 12. A little behind here, but this is the commission regulation. 11-07 Black Bear Hunt. Chief Game Larry Gilbertson and Big Game Biologist Carl Lack. This is an action item. Um, we got quite a bit of support material on this. Do you want to just give, give us the brief rundown on what all the stuff you sent us, the most recent? The B-A-R-E season. That's great. Well, starting on me too. I, I guess I can, you know, basically we were charged by this commission to bring forward uh, the regulations and CR necessary to implement a, a bear season. And uh, so what we brought forward to you today is uh, our best assessment of a conservative uh, approach to bear hunting that will do, like I mentioned earlier, uh, ensure that uh, the consumptive use of bears will not result in a negative impact 
to our bear population in Nevada. And so uh, with that, Carl can uh, give you any answers to any questions you might have. Um, I think before we get too far on, I'd like to hear public comment. Um, unless we have any specific questions, we want to go before public comment. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Carl gave an overview at the two of the CAB meetings that I attended, and I think it'd be prudent if he could do that. It only takes a minute or two for him to go through a basic population. Uh, the presentation that you did at the CABs, Carl, just basic population structure uh, data that you have collected and okay. yeah. the, the brief history. All right, well, the, the numbers that we came up with um, was from a data set that I started collecting in 1997 through 2008. Obviously, I'm still collecting that data, but the, but the analysis was based on data collected up through 2008, about 12 years' worth of data. We had over 700 occurrences in that data set, uh, occurrence being each time that we handled a bear. Uh, about 420 individual bears in the data set, um, when we started analyzing it, and I will say that we had a professional population ecologist uh, analyze the data set um, over at UNR. That's what he does for a living. He used program mark, uh, which is a mark recapture estimation. I don't want to actually call it a model. It's more of a mathematical analysis, very complex mathematical analysis. We sat down together. Um, I gave him and we, we discussed different parameters by which that, that uh, analysis, analysis would work by. And then we started looking at the individual bears. Um, we did a few things. We combined all 138 months of the study period into four three-month capture periods per year, seasonal capture periods. And uh, briefly, we had to remove about 223 bears from that analysis. 223 out of the 420 were removed from the final analysis because they didn't fit the criteria of the analysis. And by that I mean uh, program mark relies on the probability of an animal being in the population, marking that animal, and then the probability of that animal being in the population at a later date uh, and, and the chances of recapturing those animals. We removed 60 some odd cubs, 61 cubs that, were, that I had tagged as, or as dependent cubs, but they were killed before they became independent. So there was no chance of them being in another occurrence in the data set. Uh, we removed 161 untagged bears uh, that were dead on their first occurrence, bears hit by cars, things like that, uh, that obviously, again, had no, no chance of making another occurrence in the data set. So 197 bears in the final analysis, and then that analysis gives us a lot of our population demographics, uh, quarterly survival, annual survival rates, um, the rate of increase overall for the population, the global population size for that core population of that study area, uh, things like that, all those numbers that I've, that I've uh, given to you guys before. Um, some of the data was called into question, uh, lack of data, I've been accused of having a lack of data or no data or insufficient data, or not having that data available to the public. Um, two things I'd like, well, I'd like to give you guys one thing, it's a letter from, and I should mention that, that all this data, it's, it's not just my, my going out and, and tagging and, and marking these bears and collecting samples, I've been working in collaboration with partners for, for over a decade. The main one being which is Dr. John Beckman with Wildlife Conservation Society. He got his PhD at UNR working on these bears and we continue to work together. I have a letter from him, um, you guys can have a copy of, just, inform, just attesting to the quantity and the quality of the data and that it was collected in a, in a scientific, a rigorous manner. I'll give those to you. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that I've been extremely transparent over the years with the information we've collected on bears. We've written 
the Black Bear Management Plan, Black Bear Bulletins. Um, I write an annual status report. I have done that since 1998. And that annual status report 